Section 45 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 30. Giovanni Gastone. Born 1671. Reigned 1723 through 1737. Died 1737. We must not linger over the remaining years of the Medici, for their sun is setting fast, and setting in deepest gloom. From the effects of such a reign as that of Cosimo the Third, they were not able to recover, and the fourteen years' reign of the last Medici Grand Duke has little to show us upon which it is pleasant to dwell. Gian Gastoni was fifty-two when, in 1723, he succeeded to a throne which he looked upon by no means as an object of desire, but rather as a distasteful burden which he would have escaped from if he could, grievously interfering as it did with the seclusion to which, by being uniformly excluded by his father from all public affairs, he had grown accustomed. Nevertheless, Gian Gastoni set himself with commendable perseverance to reform the many abuses which weighed upon the country. He dismissed at once all the spies, hypocrites, and sycophants who had surrounded his father. He annulled at a stroke the long list of pensions, called, called pensions on the creed, paid to Jews, Turks, heterodox Catholics, heretical Protestants, and other so-called converts, which had formed a heavy item in the national expenditure and by other similar measures set himself resolutely to relieve taxation. He abolished the organized system of espionage, which had so long been established over the domestic life of the citizens. The prison doors were open, and prisoners, most of them under punishment for ecclesiastical offenses, set at liberty. Penalties were remitted, and exiles allowed to return. Imitating the example of his grandfather, Ferdinand II., Gian Gastoni mixed freely with his subjects, and to assist him in social matters, since his wife Anne of Saxe Lauenburg refused to live in Tuscany, and he disliked his arbitrary sister, the Electress, he installed his widow sister in law, the Princess Violante Beatrice, as dispenser of the hospitalities of the court. The royal palace reawoke to life. The religious gloom which had long hung round it was swept away and instead of the dark-robed monks who had pervaded its corridors and precincts, the youth and beauty of Florence were once more gathered within its walls. The Princess Violante was the bright spot in Gian Gastoni's reign. Her virtues, amiability, and good sense were invaluable to him. In a short time she became the chief influence, not only in social matters, but also in public affairs, an influence justly deserved, and followed by the best results she was universally beloved possessing considerable talents she was a zealous patroness of literature and of genius in every form her sympathy for the poor and oppressed was continually manifested cheerfulness followed wherever she appeared and we are told she was equally liked by the learned the friendless and the gay her many virtues were so generally acknowledged that pope benedict the thirteenth seventeen twenty four through seventeen thirty bestowed on her the golden rose. Nor were any found who did not consider this unusual honor deserved. The intrigues of the chief powers of Europe, as to which of them should become the possessor of Tuscany on Gian Gastoni's death, still continued, and feeling himself powerless to oppose them, the latter turned his chief attention to securing that, whenever the throne passed into other hands, his sister's inheritance of the vast private property belonging to the family should be assured to her, and to obtaining compensation to her for territorial or other possessions of the state which had been purchased out of the family's private fortune. The former category included their various palaces and villas, crowded with precious furniture and countless objects of art, which were all indisputably the private property of the family while in the latter category were included the whole of the artillery certain ports and fortresses and the town and district of pontremoldi in this endeavour gian gastoni was to a large extent successful it being conceded that the private property of the family would of course be inherited by his sister 
while the question of compensation for possessions of the state which had been purchased out of their private fortune was left for future settlement though in the end the medici received no compensation on this account during the years seventeen twenty four through seventeen thirty one the discussions and negotiations between the leading powers of europe over the tuscan secession were endless austria refusing to consider any other question until this was settled while spain endeavoured in every way to compel gian gastoni to accept don carlos as his successor fear of austria alone preventing her from sending troops into the country to enforce this meanwhile the condition of the people of tuscany steadily improved gian gastoni's reduction of taxation his abolition of the punishment of death his destruction of the hated system of domestic espionage and his efforts for the amusement of the people had brought about gaiety and light-heartedness in place of gloom and misery commerce and agriculture began to revive while the princess violante's cheerfulness spread itself everywhere everything which could create happiness among the people be encouraged by her nor did the gloomy prospects of tuscany in the political sphere blacken the people's whole horizon in those days florence was accustomed from time to time to give itself up to a simple light-hearted enjoyment which helped not a little to ameliorate adverse political conditions thus at the time of the annual carnival in particular there were not only processions of carriages coursey with battles of flowers and confetti but also numerous masked balls masquerades and other diversions of the kind in which all classes joined during carnival time masks were permitted to be worn both at the theatres and in the streets any attempt to restrict this being much resented by the people the uffici colonnade known to us under such a different aspect must have presented a singularly animated and picturesque appearance on an afternoon preceding one of these masked balls for whenever a masked ball was to take place in the evening it was customary for this to be preceded in the afternoon by a promenade in mass and dominoes under this colonnade such promenades being attended by all classes and even the grand duke himself taking part in them but a shadow was cast over everything by the proceedings of the various powers who were anxious for gian gastoni's death each bent upon being the first in the field when that event occurred a slight illness of his in seventeen twenty eight was at once represented by spain and austria as a mortal sickness whereupon an imperial edict was issued calling on the tuscans when gian gastoni expired to acknowledge the successor appointed by austria the grand duke remonstrated against such a disturbance of his government but his protests were ignored in the following year upon his dislocating an ankle by a fall reports of his death were again spread spain assembled a fleet and army to take possession of tuscany while austria sent thirty thousand men into lombardy commanded by marshal daun who offered their services to the grand duke but gian gastoni was determined if possible to prevent tuscany from being desolated by war he declined the offer and temporized with spain and the danger for the moment passed off gian gastoni agreeing to acknowledge don carlos as his successor and spain offering in return to consent to the electress anna maria ludovica being a member of the cabinet with the title of grand duchess while all europe resounded with preparations for war the death of pope benedict the thirteenth started a fresh series of negotiations austria demanded to be allowed to occupy milan while the spanish fleet threatened to seize leghorn gian gastoni still refused to agree to the occupation of any part of tuscany by either of the rival powers but began to be weary of this struggle against contending forces whom he was powerless to resist and the death of princess violante in seventeen thirty one amidst the tears of a whole nation completed his despair he had never wholly relinquished the vices to which he had taken during his father's lifetime and these now establish a complete hold over him he abandoned public affairs almost entirely to his ministers an infamous favorite giuliani dami became the head of his household the dispenser of honors and the sole channel of access to him 
and retiring from public view gian gastoni sank into absolute degradation becoming a drunken sensualist seen only by a group of the vilest companions spending half his time in bed to recover from the effects of the half ill-spent out of it and seeking diversion in the company of buffoons meanwhile spain and austria each took steps to obtain a military hold of the country a combined spanish and british fleet seized leghorn and landed an army of thirty thousand spaniards who were quartered in different parts of tuscany thereupon the emperor charles the sixth dispatched an austrian army of fifty thousand men to enter tuscany by pontremoli and a struggle in tuscany between the two powers was only averted by don carlos being called away to lead a spanish army against naples austria at the same time suffering a defeat at the passage of the po the emperor's intention was to give tuscany if he obtained it to his daughter the celebrated maria teresa the florentines on the other hand hated the idea of an austrian ruler and if they were not to have one of their own race infinitely preferred a spanish to an austrian one france looked only at what might best assist her views in regards to milan and savoy while england and holland desired peace in any way that it could be attained regardless of what consequences might result to tuscany at length in october seventeen thirty five an agreement was made between austria france england and holland as the basis of a general peace that the grand duchy of tuscany should be given to the emperor's daughter maria theresa that she should be married to francis duke of lorraine and that the latter in exchange for tuscany should resign lorraine to france tuscany thus becoming instead of lorraine an apanage of the house of austria spain at first refused to agree but having suffered reverses both in lombardy and naples eventually did so on being given a quid pro quo elsewhere and in january seventeen thirty six this agreement between the five powers was ratified at the peace of vienna the florentines were furious at their country being thus deliberately sold by the powers of europe and the more so at being after all handed over to an austrian ruler predicting that they would be subjected to a grinding tyranny gian gastoni sent urgent protests to london paris and vienna but without any avail he was looked on by the powers as a mere object of sale weakened in mind and body by his excesses plunged into deepest melancholy at the fate of his country and family and sinking under an accumulation of miseries he left his ministers to govern the country as they chose on the twelfth february seventeen eighty six francis duke of lorraine was married to maria theresa and formally renounced the duchy of lorraine in exchange for the territories of the medici whenever they should become vacant by gian gastoni's death the arrangement being guaranteed by france and austria in january seventeen thirty seven in accordance with the above convention the spanish garrisons throughout tuscany were withdrawn and austrian troops took their place general Breitwitz at florence and general wachtendonck at leghorn swearing allegiance to the grand duke on the fifth of february seventeen eighty seven but gian gastoni was already dying of an accumulation of diseases and past caring who had tuscany one last act his love of science prompted the erection in santa croce of the monument to galileo and removal to it of the latter's remains from the medici chapel attached to that church the first public act of the first medici had been that of taking a prominent part in the birthday of art the last public act of the last medici grand duke was the erection of a due memorial to science on the ninth of july seventeen thirty seven gian gastoni breathed his last at the age of sixty-six sincerely regretted by the people who had greatly benefited by his principles of government and only saw his vices dimly at a distance while they mourned at the passing away of the last ruler over tuscany belonging to their own race End of section forty five Section 46 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 31 Anna Maria Ludovica, The Last of the Medici. Born 1667, died 1743. The electress Anna Maria Ludovica was seventy years old when her brother, Gian Gastone, died. Married at twenty-four to the elector Palatine of the Rhine, she had filled an important position for twenty-six years, up to the time of his death, and her return as a widow to live with her father, Cosimo. And during those years she had shown herself to be a woman of unusual ability. After her father's death, she had, during the fourteen years of her brother's reign, lived more or less in retirement, not being on good terms with him, and feeling shame at the degradation into which he sank during the latter part of his reign. Endowed with more energy and force of character than either of her brothers, she had ruled well during the few years that her father had left the government in her hands notwithstanding that she was considerably handicapped by the style of administration which he had established as the result of her satisfactory control of affairs she had seen herself earnestly desired by the people of tuscany as their future ruler and had seen a decree passed by the florentine senate assuring the throne to her on her brother's death and she had also seen that decree spurned and overridden by the chief powers of europe herself and her ancient family insulted, and the independence of her country trampled upon. She was now to see the final stage in that process, and the inauguration of a foreign rule over Tuscany. Even the promise that in any new government established she should be a member of the council and have the rank and title of Grand Duchess being set aside it would all have been hard enough for an exceptionally proud woman like the electress anna to endure if the austrian grand duke had proceeded to occupy in person the throne which her grandfather's great-grandfather had created it was made many times worse by the kind of rule which was set up upon gian gastone's death the new grand duke francis the second came to florence and formally took possession of the state but after a month or two departed to vienna and thenceforth left the government of tuscany to be permanently administered or maladministered by an agent a certain monsieur de beauveau who was given the title of prince de crayon both he and his wife were persons of exceedingly low birth and manners yet they assumed viceregal airs lived in the royal palace and maintained a third-rate kind of court the chief feature of which was its vulgarity all posts in the new administration were speedily filled with lorrainers and the tuscans had ocular demonstration at every turn that they were now under a foreign rule the meanness the corruption and the degraded character of this collection of needy place-hunters are graphically described in the letters of the first english ambassador ever sent to the court of tuscany which show that as far as corruption in the administration was concerned the country had gained nothing by the change with a court of this description established in the palace there ensued a total decline in the dignity which even in the worst days of cosimo the third and gian gastone had ever been accustomed to reign there horace mann remarks on the entire inability of the new regime to maintain a due ceremony even on grand occasions and says they seem to forget the example of the medici the ceremony of whose court put it in their power to make a figure of things of more importance added to this the ignorance and want of taste of the newcomers in all matters relating to art was colossal and this while specially irritating to the florentines often had the most ridiculous results among other demonstrations of this want of a quality which every medici had possessed the arrangement of the pictures in the palace offered a conspicuous example these were rearranged on a new principle the two guiding rules of which were first the degree of freshness of the gilding on the frames and second the position of the figures in the picture which figures must not turn their backs towards the throne it was no wonder the new government being of this description that the electress anna the descendant of a race which even in their decay had still been distinguished 
kept herself aloof from such a company she occupied her own separate portion of the palace and had no relations with the new grand duke's agent and his wife she lived retired but it was a retirement of the utmost splendor all that art and ingenuity could supply and money purchase the aged daughter of cosimo gathered round her jewels precious metals costly attire the mass of these was immense moreover she still continued to add pictures to the uffizi gallery as a child she had known her great-uncle cardinal leopold and had imbibed some of the ideals which animated him and nearly all of the pictures of the flemish and german schools which the uffizi gallery possesses were added to it by her the amount that this daughter of the medici spent in charity astounded the english ambassador one thousand zecchins a month often more as three zecchins made one pound sterling this represented four thousand pounds a year equal at the present value of money to considerably more and even this he says she often exceeded no wonder the poor wept inconsolably when she died she continued to maintain to some extent the state to which she had been accustomed in former days the poet gray who was presented to her in seventeen forty describes her as receiving him with much ceremony standing under a huge black canopy and as never going out but to church and then with guards and eight horses to her coach thus did anna maria ludovica de medici maintain in all ways the name of her family however much that name had suffered discredit through others it suffered none through her and whether in regard to ruling with ability the encouragement of all forms of art a generous liberality to the poor or the maintenance of a proper dignity she showed herself a worthy descendant of the best of those who had gone before the object however which chiefly engaged both her time and her money was the completion of the family mausoleum the work had somewhat languished during the reigns of cosimo the third and john gastone but anna maria ludovica applied all her energies and the greater part of her large income to completing it as far as possible during the few years of life that remained to her her health was failing she knew that she had but a short time and she pressed on this work vigorously giving it as much as one thousand crowns a week and in her will leaving a large sum to be invested in order to provide a regular income for the completion of the building according to the original design there is something both pathetic and fine in the sight of this lonely and childless woman the last of her race steadily laboring in the midst of disappointment sorrow and ill health to complete the mausoleum of her ancestors before death should call her away to follow them but anna maria ludovica did something more noteworthy than this her chief act was one as fine under the circumstances as anything the medici did throughout their history and by it she caused their son so long enveloped in dark clouds and impenetrable gloom to shine out as it sank in one departing ray of most resplendent glory she hated the new dynasty she felt that her family had been grievously treated by not being allowed to leave the throne of tuscany to whomsoever they considered had the best right to it she felt herself still more grievously ill-used in not being allowed to succeed her brother as grand duchess in her own right while the sore feelings thus created were daily kept alive by the conduct of the ignoble court occupying the palace which had been built by her family and had been their home for two hundred years but at the same time she loved tuscany she was keenly mindful of her family's long and honorable connection with that country and she was determined that whatever her father and brother had been she at least would support that connection with honor to the very end and so she made that splendid gift which should make her name ever honored in florence far-reaching memories and mingled feelings must have filled the mind of anna maria ludovica as last solitary owner of the greatest collection of art treasures in the world she wandered through the long galleries of the uffizi and the pitti surrounded by this mass of pictures statues bronzes rare gems and other works of art 
the earliest of them executed for cosimo piero and lorenzo the latest added to the collection by herself and thought over what she had determined on doing with this great inheritance the convention between the powers which had assigned the throne to a foreign prince had not touched the vast private property of the family including the countless objects of art and other valuable things with which their palaces villas and picture galleries were crowded and to all these she had succeeded on her brother's death the whole of this invaluable collection of treasures anna maria ludovica now gave to the state of tuscany for ever in the person of the new grand duke and his successors on condition that none of it should ever be removed from florence and that it should be for the benefit of the public of all nations what the value in money of this truly royal gift may be is probably beyond computation it included with much besides a the whole of the pictures and statues which were in the uffizi gallery the royal palace the villa medici at rome and the other villas of the family and now forming the uffizi and pitti galleries b the rare collection of gems and other objects of art now in the gem room of the uffizi gallery c a great collection of cameos engraved gems and similar articles now in the museum of the bargello and including the celebrated collection of coins and medallions of lorenzo the magnificent the oldest in europe d statues and busts by donatello verrocchio mino da fiesole and other notable sculptors now in the museum of the bargello e a great collection of bronzes now in the museum of the bargello f the new sacristy with the masterpieces of michelangelo g the whole of the contents of the library of the palace and the medici library in san lorenzo h a large and important collection of egyptian and etruscan antiquities now forming the chief part of the egyptian and etruscan museums the etruscan portion being specially valuable i a valuable collection of majolica urbino ware faenza ware rare suits of armor and curious and valuable arms now in the museum of the bargello j a large collection of valuable tapestries now forming the galleria degli arazzi k the valuable tables of pietra dura work cabinets and other precious furniture now in the uffizi and pitti galleries l the inlaid tables valuable cabinets tapestry and other similar articles now in the royal apartments of the pitti palace m the gold dessert service gold and silver ornaments rare china valuable plate croziers and crucifixes in ivory and amber the mitre with miniatures made of hummingbirds feathers which had belonged to clement the seventh priceless works in yellow handsome goblets and vases by benvenuto cellini and many other heirlooms of the family all now in the treasure room of the pitti palace n the reliquaries and other ornaments of the grand ducal chapel in the pitti palace o the immense medician wardrobe of costly robes and dresses for state occasions from poggio imperiale from castello from petraia from cafagiolo from poggio a caiano from the villa medici at rome from every habitation that the medici had occupied poured in for many years afterwards this great collection of objects of art to be gathered in the galleries and museums of florence in accordance with the terms of this gift terms to which florence owes it that these treasures have not been long since either dispersed or removed to vienna or rome the medici themselves have passed away but their works live on and of all that they have left behind them as a record of the spirit which animated them nothing can surpass that which a whole world enjoys through the gift which was their last act and which the traditions of their house and the principles implanted long before by its founder caused them to present to their nation even when smarting under a sense of injustice and disappointment speaking of this action an italian writer of the present day has said 
by this act the princess anna maria in securing to the country so much that was most notable of its art acquired a truly imperishable title to the gratitude of italy and one which deserved to outweigh and make forgiven many faults of her ancestors it is when one looks at the florence of to-day without manufactures or the business of a seaport and yet so prosperous a city that one realizes what this gift with all the others previously given by the medici has meant to her that prosperity entirely depends on florence's power to attract visitors from other countries without that power she the second city of italy would sink back at once to the level of her ancient rival luca and were all that the medici gave to florence taken away the whole of that influx of visitors from other countries would cease for her three great churches would not by themselves attract it and even san marco would be gone so that anna maria ludovica little as she could have realized all that its consequences would be by this parting gift in the name of her family did the very best thing she could have done to ensure the future prosperity of florence yet in the city which her action has thus enriched her very name is almost unknown no statue of her adorns any of its open spaces no gallery or museum of all those which she has to a great extent filled and protected from having their contents removed to other cities has her name written over its doors or any bust or picture of her placed in honor on its walls and thousands interested in art pass through florence every season or even leave that city after long residence there without ever having heard her name of the items included in this gift the last the medician wardrobe was not permanently retained some thirty years afterwards in the time of the grand duke pietro leopoldo the first of the austrian grand dukes who was a resident ruler of tuscany it was broken up and sold and some idea of the magnificence customary in what we now know as the pitti palace in the time of the medici grand dukes is given us by the details of this sale which on account of the mass of valuable things to be disposed of continued monthly for ten years napier says nor was the ancient medician wardrobe which had long reposed in idle splendor more spared by the stern frugality of leopold almost every residence of the medici throughout tuscany had its peculiar wardrobe independent of the great magazine of medician splendor in florence and all were now exposed to public sale velvets damasks gold embroideries chairs and mirror frames of massive silver gold brocades rich lace fringes and costly silken fabrics were either sold to the public or condemned to the crucible john gastone's state bed embroidered throughout with a profusion of beautiful pearls and other gems was picked to pieces and many exquisite works in jewellery and precious metals the symbols of medician taste and magnificence were all broken up or otherwise disposed of to the amount of half a million of crowns anna maria ludovica had not to endure for many years the daily mortifications resulting from the establishment of a foreign rule over her country in seventeen forty two five years after that rule had been set up her health began to give way she suffered much from dropsy and felt that she had not much longer to live having still a large amount of personal property to dispose of including her own wearing jewels the contents of her wardrobes the furniture of her rooms china plate and nearly two million pounds sterling in money she set about adding various codicils to the will which she had made some three years before and desiring to leave some portion of her property to her next of kin whoever he might be she had drawn up for her a genealogical tree showing not only the historic medici the descendants of giovanni di bici of whom she was the last but also the collateral branches of the family by its means retracing her family for some four hundred and fifty years back to salvestro the grandfather of giovanni di bici she discovered that a descendant of salvestro's brother giovenco a certain pietro paolo de medici was her nearest of kin though not of course a descendant of the historic medici 
whereupon she added a clause to her will declaring him her heir and leaving him a portion of her property she only lived a few months after completing these final testamentary dispositions and on the eighteenth february seventeen forty three at the age of seventy six anna maria ludovica the last remaining descendant of giovanni di bici passed away and the family which he had founded and which had had such a long and eventful history was extinct the chief provisions of anna maria ludovica's will and its codicils are briefly detailed by the english ambassador horace mann as follows one all her courtiers and servants to have their salaries for life two pensions to her four executors three to pay the above pensions and salaries a large sum of money deposited in the bank of santa maria nuova four to the marquis rinoncini the principal executor her lands in the state of urbino and a considerable legacy of much of the rich furniture in her audience room five her china half to young rinoncini and half to caroni six to the marquis guadagni to Siristori and to Bardi, her three other executors, besides their pensions, very rich presents in silver. 7. To Madame Uguccioni, her mistress of the robes, the whole of the contents of a room containing, besides many other things, velvet brocades, linen, etc., valued at ten thousand crowns, and a toilet service of gold. 8 to all her maids of honour presents and the usual fortunes in case of marriage nine to the austrian grand duke she left the whole of her own wearing jewels annexing them to those of the state of tuscany with which they are to descend their value in present money is supposed to be about five hundred thousand pounds besides this the grand duke is left heir to a thousand other things ten to her più prossimo agnato nearest of kin pietro paolo de medici thirty thousand crowns and as other pensioners die off their pensions go to him and his heirs till the sum is made up to one hundred thousand crowns also jewels and plate valued at about a hundred and fifty thousand crowns eleven presents in jewels to the queen of hungary maria theresa to prince charles and to several princes of germany twelve also a very large legacy to the prince of salzbach elector palatine a codicil dated seventh october seventeen thirty nine provided that on the death of legatees who were given pensions under the will the portions of the estate set free by their death are to be invested by the executors in sound securities and the interest of such investments to be devoted to carrying on finishing and perfecting the royal mausoleum situated behind the choir of the venerable church of san lorenzo with the same excellence and preciousness employed up to the present and on the plan of the models and designs which have been made on the night of the twenty second february a stately funeral accompanied by every accessory which could heighten its melancholy grandeur and surrounded by so great a mass of torches that they lighted up the entire street as the procession moved along left the royal palace and passed slowly down the via maggio over the ponte santa trinita and along the via tornaboni to the mausoleum behind san lorenzo the body was conveyed in a sort of coach quite open and with a canopy over the head it was the funeral given by the orders of the austrian grand duke to her who had hoped to die grand duchess of tuscany in her own right thus with solemn pomp and amidst the tears of the many poor whom she had assisted was laid with her ancestors in that mausoleum where none any more were to be buried one who had maintained not unworthily the honour of her family and whose tomb bears the inscription the last of the royal race of the medici end of section forty six section forty seven of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by mina gahari the medici volume two by g f young chapter thirty two san lorenzo and the tombs of the medici 
followed by epilogue. And so the long story of the Medici closes, and closes where it began in that venerable church of San Lorenzo, which they built and endowed, and which gathers in itself all the threads of their chequered history during the 343 years which lie between the tomb of Giovanni di Bicci in the old sacristy and that of Anna Maria Ludovica in the crypt of the mausoleum behind the choir. In this church they were baptised as children, married as young men and girls, and buried when their lives came to an end, for family tradition required that they should all be laid at last in San Lorenzo. And here the black threads of tragedy and sorrow, the blue ones of love and happiness, and the golden ones of gratified ambition, mingle and cross each other in the great tapestry of this family's long romance. Here, in this church of San Lorenzo, soon after its rebuilding was finished, was seen the first great mourning of the family, when Cosimo's favourite son, Giovanni, died, soon followed by the funeral of Cosimo himself. Here, four years later, took place the splendid marriage of the young Lorenzo to Clarice Orsini, when the whole city gave itself up to feasting and delight. A few years later, we have a far different scene in San Lorenzo. It is after the murder at High Mass of the people's favourite, Giuliano, in the huge black catafalque surrounded with tall candles in the centre of the nave. The solemn music and the weeping crowd attest a whole city's grief. Then come other scenes. The Medici are in exile, and every inch of standing space in the church is occupied by a deeply moved crowd listening to the great preacher Savonarola, who delivered some of his most impressive sermons from the carved black marble pulpit which stands in the north aisle. Four years after the return of the Medici comes the funeral of Giuliano, Duke di Nemur, the first of the family to be buried in the new sacristy, then just added to the church. And this is followed three years later by the pompous funeral of his nephew, Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino. Then after Florence's struggle for liberty is over, and Alessandro has been installed as Duke, we have another imposing scene in San Lorenzo. It is the marriage of Alessandro to Margaret, daughter of Charles V, the last step in a scheme which had subjected the city to a tyrant's rule, and the crowd which looks on is a sullen and dispirited one. Six months later, we have again a burial in San Lorenzo, but it is a very different one from any which have preceded. In the dead of night, with as few lights as possible, in silence and secrecy, the murder being still unknown to the city, is hurriedly borne into San Lorenzo by a few hired servants, the body of the detested Alessandro. The lid of the sarcophagus of Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino, in the new sacristy, is forced open, the body unceremoniously placed therein, the sarcophagus again closed, and the small band of servants depart as secretly as they have come. This is followed two years afterwards by the marriage of Duke Cosimo to Eleonora di Toledo, in the presence of her father, the Viceroy of Naples, and a numerous retinue of Spanish nobles. Twenty-three years later, San Lorenzo witnessed those two sad funerals when Cosimo buried within one month his wife Eleonora and his two sons Giovanni and Garzia. And then, after the Medici had become Grand Dukes, San Lorenzo saw a long succession of splendid marriages and pathetic funerals, beginning with the marriage of Cosimo's son, Francis, to the Archduchess Joanna, the sister of an emperor, and ending with the funeral of Anna Maria Ludovica, when San Lorenzo witnessed, for the last time, the burial of one of the House of Medici. The plain, severe style of the church, with its columns of grey pietra serena, the quiet stone, has an indescribably peaceful effect. In the old sacristy, at the end of the south transept, lie Giovanni di Bici, his wife Picarda, and his two grandsons, Piero il Cottoso and Giovanni. In front of the high altar of the church lies Cosimo Patipatriae, and at the end of the north transept we have the new sacristy. That chamber of the dead where the gigantic shapes of night and day, turned into stone, rest everlastingly, Rogers. Here, where so many of the House of Medici have at different times been interred, there still rest the remains of Lorenzo the Magnificent, his brother Giuliano, Lorenzo's son Giuliano, Duke di Nemur, Lorenzo's grandson Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino, and Alessandro. Then comes the gap. Pietro, buried at Monte Cassino, Leo X and Clement VII, buried in Rome, and Catherine, buried in France, being absent. Lastly, in the mausoleum behind the choir, lie Giovanni della Bandanera and his wife Maria, with the 32 remaining members of the family. In the case of the old and new sacristies, the sarcophagi contain the remains of those to whom they refer, but in the case of the mausoleum, all the tombs are in the crypt, 
the sarcophagi in the upper portion of the mausoleum being only intended as monuments. As the church of San Lorenzo stands on a height, and as the floor of the mausoleum is on a level with that of the church, it results that the crypt of the mausoleum is above ground, being on the ground level of the Piazza Madonna, from which there is now an entrance to the crypt. As originally built, there was no entrance from the Piazza Madonna, and the crypt could only be reached by the staircase leading down into it from the floor of the mausoleum. It was therefore a place which was easy to keep the coffin secure from all danger of depredation by thieves who might seek to plunder them of the jewels which they contained. And in this crypt, the coffins, standing in the places marked by respective tombstones, remained for about 100 years. But in 1791, the Austrian Grand Duke Ferdinand III decided to remove them from this situation. A mortuary chapel for the Austrian Grand Dukes had been constructed in part of the vault of the Church of San Lorenzo, and to reach it more conveniently, this Grand Duke made an entrance from the Piazza Madonna into the crypt of the Medici Mausoleum, so as to reach, by passing through the latter, the mortuary chapel which lies beyond it. This throwing open of the crypt of the mausoleum made it necessary to remove the Medici coffins elsewhere. Beneath this upper crypt there is a lower, subterranean one, of exactly the same size and shape, and to this the Grand Duke Ferdinand III removed the Medici coffins. Either during this removal of the coffins to the lower crypt in 1791, or during the sixty years after it, owing to want of due guard over them after they were placed in the lower crypt, thieves obtained access to the coffins, plundering a number of them of their jewels and creating considerable disorder. In 1856, to remedy this state of things, it was decided to institute an official examination of the whole of the coffins, to open and examine each carefully, and to rearrange them in due order. Before this took place, the Pope, Pius IX, visited the mausoleum, and after holding a service in the crypt, gave his authority for this examination of the bodies, ordering it to be conducted with due reference for the dead. This was then carried out by a commission appointed by the government in 1857. The coffins, to the number of 49, were in turn opened and examined, and the condition of the bodies, their dress and ornaments were minutely detailed in an official report. The report showed, as will be seen by the details which have been given in the footnotes on the subject, that the bodies of all those who were cardinals had been left untouched by the thieves, but that all others had been robbed of most of their jewels. The examination being concluded, the coffins were again closed and were arranged in the lower crypt in the same situations as they had occupied in the upper crypt, each being placed immediately under the tombstone in the upper crypt having reference to it. And this done, the entrance to the lower crypt, at the bottom of the flight of steps which leads down to it, was then walled up. Thus each tombstone in the upper crypt is over the coffin to which it refers. In the centre, buried in his black armour, lies Giovanni della Bandinera, with on his tombstone the words Cognomento Invictus, and by his side his wife, Maria Salviati. Around them, in the various bays and other parts of the crypt, lie their descendants of six generations. Anna Maria Ludovica, the last of them, rests near one of the centre pillars. Each of the first four Grand Dukes is interred in one of the bays, with his wife and two of his children. Similarly, in the upper part of the mausoleum, each monument stands over the spot in the crypt which holds the tomb of that Grand Duke. The three places of sepulture, the old sacristy at the end of the south transept, the new sacristy at the end of the north transept, and the mausoleum adjoining the choir, serve to mark the stages through which the Medici passed. We see them first as careful and assiduous men of business, prudent, generous of their wealth, and unflinching defenders of the poorer classes against tyranny, then as far-sighted and capable statesmen, heavily burdened with public affairs, and steadily raising the power and prosperity of their country above all her former rivals, and at the same time spending both efforts and wealth on the advancement of learning and the encouragement of all forms of art. Lastly, we see them as crowned heads, ruling over a state which had been made by them the most important in Italy, and in each of these stages we see them, until their decay, incontestably superior to all their contemporaries similarly situated. Nor should the evils of one reign be allowed to occupy all the foreground of the picture to the exclusion of everything else. Many other Medici had governed Tuscany before Cosimo III, and a single bad reign should not be suffered to do more than balance a single good one. The evil effects of Cosimo III's reign have long since passed away. The lasting benefits to Tuscany brought about by Cosimo I, Ferdinand I, Cosimo II, and Ferdinand II 
not to mention Cosimo Partipatriae and Lorenzo the Magnificent, remain for all time. Lastly, they were as a family justly to be called great. Great in their extraordinary ability, great in their large-mindedness, great in their generosity of character, great in their unparalleled love for learning and art, great in their abounding energy, vitality and many-sidedness, great, above all, in their peculiar gift for pouring oil on troubled waters and allaying fierce political passions which no others could pacify. Speaking of their attainments and the causes to which their success was due, Iriate says, The grasp of the varied capacity and the enterprising spirit of the Medici may be gathered from the specimens of their correspondence preserved in the archives of Florence. They are equally at home in the most contrasted topics, in war, in diplomacy, in domestic administration, in foreign policy, in literature and in the fine arts. The success was due in no small degree to the grandeur of conception, liberality and nobility of mind that seemed natural to this family. Looked at as a whole, they stand out as worthy reflectors of the glory of Tuscany, the Medici, whatever else they may have been, were at all events there are Florentines, and loved Florence with an ardour which none can surpass. When they became Grand Dukes, they did not, as might have been the case, rule from a distance, receiving the surplus revenue of the state, spending their wealth elsewhere, and interesting themselves but little in the welfare of Florence. Instead of this, they so thoroughly made themselves one with Florence that her history and theirs are bound up together. They gloried in her glory, they increased in it in countless ways, and they so completely identified themselves with all that does honour to Florence that it is herself she would most honour in honouring them. To obliterate their memory from Florence is impossible. Well chosen was their motto, Semper, which the earlier members of the family adopted. Wherever we turn in that city, reminiscences of them confront us. The Medici Palace, the home of their earlier days, still stands, solemn and grand, as when it was the hotel of the princes of the whole world, and memorable for much else besides. Castello speaks to us of Maria Salviati and her gallant soldier husband. The Piazza Santa Trinita, with its grave column of justice, the Ponte Vecchio, with its strange passaggio, and the broad sweep of the Ponte Santa Trinita, bring to our minds the iron-handed but capable ruler Cosimo I. The bobbly gardens are eloquent of Eleonora di Toledo and her band of healthy children. The spacious Pitti Palace, the home of the family's later days, is still the royal residence of Tuscany as when the beautiful Isabella danced and sang and led all social functions there. The great mausoleum reminds us of Ferdinand I and his prophetic speech. Poggio Imperiale and the pictures in the long gallery over the Arno Recall Maria Maddalena with her accomplished sisters-in-law, Eleonora, Caterina and Claudia, and her lively daughters, Maria Cristina, Margherita and Anna. In the Uffizi and Pitti galleries, we are surrounded by mementos of the three talented brothers, Ferdinand II, Giovanni Carlo and Leopold. And everywhere in crowded museums and galleries we see pictures, statues, bronzes, gems, vases, inlay tables, costly cabinets, and other objects of art innumerable, every one of which has been examined with interest and eventually purchased by some member of this family. As we stand in the magnificent mausoleum where their line comes to an end, and, surrounded by their great porphyry monuments, finished with a workmanship given to a costly gem, think of this family's long history, their gifts to their country and to Europe, and their last gift to Florence of so much that is precious to all the world we realise something of what the Medici were and did, and feel they were indeed no ordinary people, and that their works were of the kind that survives the funeral fires, and endures when tombs and monuments have crumbled into dust. Epilogue It has been said by one who felt the grandeur of their history, Let the Medici rest in peace in their tombs of marble and porphyry, for they have done more for the glory of the world than any king, prince or emperor. But they did more than that, and we must not in their case say, sic transit gloria mundi. While other rulers of their time have left nothing but a memory of their own personal glory, that glory which we know passes so utterly away, the Medici have left something more lasting than that. They are all past and gone now, all these Medici whose lives we have been following, and those also whose story intermingles with theirs. Pico della Mirandola, the bright and beautiful sunbeam. Savonarola, the martyred reformer. Bourbon, the sad and ruined soldier, the three great antagonists, Charles, Francis and Henry, 
bore that glorious company of the great in art and many other distinguished names. All their hopes, ambitions, wrongdoings and sorrows are in the grave now. Some, setting before them a purely selfish aim and striving after nothing really great, have left nothing behind them except it to be a name on which men cast contempt. Others, whether as artists, scholars or rulers, aspiring after some aim higher than this, have left behind them things which still shed a blessing of one kind or another on mankind, and so their memory is honoured. Of all those whose names have passed before us the great in art, at any rate, have left behind them the works which are still a source of good to mankind, giving it its highest form of enjoyment, and ever drawing it upwards from all that is trivial and ignoble. That we still possess these is due in large measure to the Medici, and greater even than this is their other work, the resuscitation of learning, which has spread knowledge far and wide, with benefits to mankind that are immeasurable. This is the glory that the Medici have, and this glory will not pass away. End of section 47 End of the Medici, volume 2, by G. F. Young